Yeah, hi, my name is Dr. Thomas Clements. I work at the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm a paleontologist and I specialize in trying to understand how fossils form. So today I'm going to give you a little whistle stop tour, um, learning how fossil, uh, an animal can become a fossil. And we're going to be using the example of my pet, Fred the Fishy. Um, unfortunately, Fred the Fishy recently perished as the life of all animals comes to the end. And so we're going to try to work out how we can turn Fred into a fossil to confuse future paleontologists. So the question is, how do we turn something that is, in, is squishy, like you and me, that has bone and, and, and tissues, uh, such as muscles and skin, how do we turn that into rock, is the question that we're going to try and answer today. So the first thing I want to ask is, what even is a fossil? Um, when you go to a museum, and you walk around, the thing that you might notice is that all fossils kind of look vaguely similar. Um, so this is the Lapworth Museum up at Birmingham, um, where we have a giant Allosaurus skeleton. But when you're walking around, what you'll notice is that there'll be lots of pictures of what these animals look like in the past. Like this is a, a very famous fossil you can find in Lyme Regis called an ammonite. Um, but when we actually have the fossils, they kind of only look like this. All the soft parts are missing and we only have the shell. And that's true of dinosaurs as well. So whenever you see dinosaurs in museums, they'll always be the skeletons, even though we know they looked probably something like this, where they had lots of fleshy bits, um, uh, skin and muscles. They might have even had really cool things like feathers. Um, but we typically only really find the skeletons. And also like other famous examples are things like the woolly mammoth, um, which we, we know what they looked like because they're a living ancestor today and we reconstruct them, they have all these like, you know, these amazing reconstructions. We have lots of hair and their big trunk, but we don't find any of that in the fossil record. Predominantly, we only find the hard parts. So that's the bones, the teeth, and, and typically shells. And those hard parts themselves have turned to stone. So the fossils that we're actually extracting out of the ground are effectively a type of stone now. So why is it that we only really find the hard parts of these animals? Well, the simple answer is that is that when things die, they decay and they rot away. And this is a, a natural process. It happens all the time, everywhere. And you can see that it happens because when you go outside, when you walk to work or when you walk to school, you don't have to wade through a sea of dead bumblebees or dead earthworms or dead pigeons. And that's because nature naturally recycles these things all the time. And it might look disgusting and it might smell very gross, but it is super important. And it's really important for nature because uh, when an animal is, is decaying or rotting, it's being eaten by other organisms and those organisms are getting energy. And also the nutrients that are left over are leaking into the ground and feeding things like trees and other plants. And it's a big cycle. So it's really, really important in nature. So if our fishy is to die at the bottom of the sea, the first thing that we'd want to eat is other creatures that are very, very hungry. So things like shrimps, maybe even a starfish, maybe an octopus if you're very lucky. But these animals will scavenge, and we call them scavengers, will scavenge um, meat or, or other animals that are on the seafloor and they'll strip them of all of their flesh very, very quickly because these animals are very hungry and a dead fishy sitting at the bottom of the sea is a free meal, basically free fish fingers. But what's really interesting is if we look inside the fish using specialist equipment like a microscope, we can actually see that the thing that does the main eating isn't really scavengers, but it's actually bacteria. And bacteria are really, really interesting to study because when you think of bacteria, we often think of like one, or when we think of a scavenger, we think of one organism, but with bacteria, it's not one organism. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of them living on you all the time anyway. So when there's something for them to eat, they go absolutely crazy and their population just explodes and they do the majority of the eating inside you. So you can't actually see any of this, but this is what's happening underneath a microscope. And bacteria will eat pretty much anything. They are not super fussy eaters, but they don't have mouths like you and me. They don't eat by chewing. The way they eat is actually really weird. They eat using chemicals 
and they actually like basically absorb um, nutrients. Um, and it's a very weird way. It's very complex and we're not going to talk too much about it, but they basically absorb nutrients out of the, 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 the decaying animal. But although they'll eat everything, they're kind of fussy about what they'll eat first. So what is a fishy made of? Let's just quickly get that out of the way. If I dissect a fishy, a fish is made up of three main things, pretty much. It's made up of internal organs, and then it's made up of the meat, which is the muscles, which is what you would eat. That's what's inside your fish fingers. And then it's the leftover bits, basically the skeleton. Now, bacteria will eat the squishy stuff first because it's much easier to break down. So they'll tend to start digesting the internal organs first, and then they'll move on to the slightly tougher food, so the things like the muscles. And eventually, once they've eaten all of the internal organs and all of the muscles, then they'll move on to the really hard parts like the bones. And it might take them a very long time, but they will get through all of them. And some bacteria prefer different parts of the organism. So for instance, some bacteria really like the, the juicy stuff, like the soft tissues, and some bacteria specialize in eating just bones. So bacteria like different foods, different species of bacteria like different foods. And it might take a long time, but eventually bacteria will get through everything. So if you leave a fishy lying around, um, well, you wouldn't want to leave it lying around in your kitchen, but if you did leave it lying around in the kitchen, if you gave it enough time, eventually the bacteria would eat everything there. Um, and again, that's why you don't see many skeletons lying around uh, generally, is because eventually the bacteria will just completely eat them. So if you leave your fish lying around normally and bacteria will eat everything, how do you turn a fish into a fossil? Well, one thing that often people, when I ask them that question, will say, oh, well, why don't we just bury Fred the fish? Well. We can bury Fred the fish, but actually decay will continue to happen if we bury Fred. So if we bury him and put him underground, scavengers and bacteria can still get to him and he'll get turned into a skeleton pretty quickly. And eventually those scavengers and the bacteria will completely strip away all the bone and there'll be nothing left at all. But we can bury Fred in soil or sediment that has very low amounts of oxygen. And if we do that, what happens is the scavengers can't really live there. So it takes a lot longer for uh, Fred the fish to get broken down and all the soft tissues to, to get eaten. But we still need something to happen to stop the skeleton from being eaten by the bacteria. So in some circumstances, in some very rare circumstances, when we bury a skeleton, something pretty amazing happens. And if we look at bone underneath a microscope, even though bone feels very solid to us, and when we think about bone, we think of something that's very hard. Actually, bone is full of tiny microscopic holes called pores. And those pores are really important in the fossilization process, because if you move water through the sediment, sometimes water can pick up minerals, like tiny, tiny bits of rock. And basically, as the water moves through the sediment, it can enter the bones and it can leave those minerals behind. And eventually over millions of years, that turns the bone into rock. So this is a process called perimineralization, which is a very fancy word for what I've just described. But if that process occurs before the skeleton is fully eaten, then basically though that skeleton will turn into rock. And that's how a fossil is formed. And if it survives for millions of years and is found by human beings and isn't eroded or smashed up by an earthquake, you have a fossil. And if we're lucky enough to find that fossil, we can study it and we can work on it and we can understand everything about these fossil fishies. And what's really cool about this is that in science, like you might have heard of the term fossilization, which is how a fossil is made, but actually the word fossilization means all of the processes that happen to organics from the moment the animal dies all the way up to becoming a fossil. And actually the process of perimineralization, what we just talked about a second ago, that's actually the, an act of preservation. So there's a difference between those two words, scientifically speaking. It doesn't really matter in everyday conversation, but when I'm speaking to my colleagues, there is an important difference between fossilization and preservation. Now, 
What I'm really interested in are fossils that aren't just skeletons. So when I'm doing my research, I'm really super interested in fossils that have soft parts. So these are fossil fish from Brazil. They're about 60 million years old. They come from a place called Santana. And they have, you can see that they have beautiful fossil skin and all of their scales being preserved. Like these are really beautiful fossils. But what's even more amazing is if you put them in an X-ray machine, the same sort of machine that you would go in if you broke your arm in hospital, we can see inside them and we can see that the, the soft tissues, like the internal organs are still preserved and they've been turned to rock as well. So for instance, we can see the gills, we can see heart, we can see muscles, we can even see the sort of the guts, the intestines. And these aren't soft and squishy anymore. Like I said, they've turned to rock. So I'm really interested in a paleontologist, as a paleontologist, sorry, trying to understand how did these soft, squishy things turn to rock? Surely they would have been eaten by bacteria very, very quickly when these animals were buried. So in order for this to happen, we need to have some form of conditions in, in the sediment, in the soil when they're buried, that will stop the recycling of organics. So we want, so we want recycling to completely stop. So we need to stop scavengers from being able to get there. Now, you would think that we would also need bacteria to not be able to eat. But actually, we now know that we need bacteria to uh, eat the, um, uh, the, the, the tissues, but we just need them to eat it very slowly. And we need special minerals to be in the rocks. And there's an interaction between the minerals and the bacteria. So the more the bacteria eat, the more they change the environment around them, because when they eat, they, they go to the toilet like we do. And by going to the toilet, they change the environmental conditions. And that allows different minerals to actually grow and start replacing the soft tissues. So it's, a, it's really counterintuitive, but we actually need the bacteria to eat stuff in order for fossils with soft tissues to be made. And we can get some really amazing fossils. So my favorite animal is the octopus. If you know anything about octopuses, they have no skeletons. They have no very little hard parts. They're basically made, they're just sacks of water effectively. But we get beautiful fossil octopuses because when they were buried, this mineral called calcium phosphate or apatite actually grew over the tissues and replaced them. So you get beautiful fossils. And we actually see a very similar type of preservation happening um, in Lyme Regis, uh, in the fossils that are in Lyme Regis. And paleontologists like myself, we go out into the world and we look for these ancient fossil sites that had these right conditions because they're really, really important to allow us to understand much more about the ancient past. So here's a picture of me in China doing some work, trying to understand how the fossils formed in these sites. And we, as scientists, like to have fancy words for everything. So we have a fancy word for a fossil site that preserves soft tissues. And that fancy word is Lagerstätten. And Lagerstätten comes from German, and it just means storage place. So it's somewhere, uh, these are rocks that store um, uh, fossils that have soft tissues. That's all it means. So some examples from millions of years ago that would have been good places would have been places like ocean floors where you would have had lots of sediment being dumped in or a river mouth, perhaps a stagnant lake where an animal would die and sink to the bottom and not be disturbed, or maybe even some types of swamps um, where an animal would fall in and be buried very quickly. And these one thing or some things that these sites all have in common is that you get buried very, very quickly and there tends to be very little oxygen in these environments. More recently, you might have heard of things like um, uh, uh, frozen woolly mammoths in the tundra, or maybe you've heard about tar pits where animals fell into the tar and were preserved. And they too, they're much more recent. Um, these um, uh, are actually not fossils, they're proto-fossils or sub-fossils, and they haven't turned to rock yet, but they might do in the future. But there are still shared features of these sites that are really important that stopped bacteria from being able to eat them. So in the tundra, because it's very, very cold, it's a bit like your fridge, you actually can slow down the amount of decay that's happening. And in the tar pits, there's very, very low levels of oxygen, so the bacteria can't eat all the soft tissues. But one thing that's really important to note is that there are shared factors in all of these sites 
whether it's cold temperatures, low levels of oxygen, very rapid burial, or just an abundance of minerals that are required to actually turn soft, squishy things into rock. And those factors interact with each other in different ways in order to allow fossils to form. And my job is to try and work out how these form. And when I do this by doing experiments in the laboratory where I try to, I don't try to recreate fossils, but I try to understand the different environmental conditions required for fossils to form. And like I just said, these Lagerstätten are super important and they're super important for us to try and understand because not only do they preserve animals that wouldn't normally preserve, so they give us a lot more information about ancient animals, but they also give us a lot of information about the ecosystems that existed in the past because we get a much wider range of organisms being preserved. So how do we understand these processes of preservation and fossilization that I've talked about? Well, there is a complete subscience within paleontology called taphonomy. And taphonomy comes from ancient Greek. It means the study of burial. And it's basically the study of everything that happens to an animal from the moment it dies, all the way up to it becoming discovered by a human being as a fossil. So that's death, burial, all the, the chemical processes that happen after burial, and then all of the processes that happen all the way up to us finding it. So it being eroded or being um, affected by an earthquake, all of these sorts of things. And there is a whole subfield within paleontology of all about experimental taphonomy. So these are, um, this has been around for about 100 years, and it started um, in the sort of 1900s, where people just looked at what happened to animals when they were decaying to try and work out what, what might have happened in the ancient past. And then in the 1950s, a Russian paleontologist um, basically came up with this idea of taphonomy, and he sort of coined the term taphonomy and started to um, uh, write uh, books about how we should try to understand what happens to animals in order to understand how fossils formed. And then in the 1960s, we started doing experiments. So they started off being really simple, where they would just take little tiny like insects and they would tumble them in containers full of water and sand and see what happened to them, like mimicking what would happen if, you, if an insect was trapped in a river and moving downstream. Um, and then these experiments became more complex. We started to look at trying to understand the different variables. So what happens to a, a, a fish um, body if you put it in very low temperatures or if you put it in very low oxygen environments or if you put lots and lots of salt in the water with the dead fish body. And these sorts of experiments gave us a very basic understanding of what happens to animals after they die. And nowadays we can use super complex machines, giant machines, um, where we can basically look at fossils and we can zap them um, using all different types of uh, chemistries. We can use uh, different types of energy beams, X-rays, all sorts of really fancy equipment. And we can actually look at what's happening inside the fish um, in real time as it's decaying. And we can do some pretty crazy experiments now where we can look at things like pigments, um, like that's what gives you color in your skin or in your hair. And we can look at what happens to those as they're decaying. So really complex, cutting edge science now. And there are lots of different types of investigation. So some scientists might be interested in trying to understand uh, the like when we look at the rocks, what the environment was like millions of years ago. Some might be trying to understand like me, how fossils actually form, how an animal turns into a rock. Other people might be interested in looking at why some animals turn into rocks uh, or turn into fossils better than other animals that are related to each other. And some people might be interested in looking at the different variables. So what would happen if I, I don't know, put a fish inside a, a tank of water and then shook it every day when it was decaying? Would that have an impact on how it would become a fossil? So things like that. And we're really interested in the interaction of these things because only by understanding them individually can we start to place them together in a bigger picture. And this is part of my work that I do, where I do experiments in the lab with my colleagues um, where we look at like, for, for instance, a lot of my work involves fish and we'll look at, uh, we'll buy fish from fishmongers and we'll, we'll take them back to the lab and we'll put them in all different types of environment and we'll let them rot and we'll watch them rot. And it's very disgusting, very smelly work, but it's really interesting. 
So that is a, an absolute whistle-stop tour of how a fossil forms. But I'm just going to recap very quickly using Mr. Snuffles, the hamster. And we're going to talk about how Mr. Snuffles can become a fossil and what you would need to do with your hamster if you wanted it to become a fossil. So you'd need to wait for Mr. Snuffles to cease to be. Um, generally, things don't become fossils unless they've died. Um, so we're going to let Mr. Snuffles, after Mr. Snuffles dies, we're going to keep his body. Um, and then we're going to try and slow the decay down. So we're going to try and keep him as cold as possible. So one good way of doing that would be putting him in the fridge. I don't think mum and dad would like it if you put them in the fridge. So just need to try and keep it as cool as possible. And then we need to bury Mr. Snuggles as quickly as we can in an area that has very high burial rates. So that's if you just place him in the garden, it's not going to work because the garden is full of worms and there's lots of bacteria. So we need to bury him somewhere special, somewhere where there's probably low oxygen. And if you can keep him cold and have things like lots of salt in the environment, that's going to help, help as well. Because we need to make sure that the scavengers can't get to Mr. Snuggles. So places like dropping him to the bottom of the ocean floor or in a river mouth, or maybe a stagnant lake or a swamp, if you can get to the tundra, which would be a little bit of a plane journey, probably not advisable under co in COVID. If you can get to the tundra, that's a great place. We can try and bury him somewhere where it's very cold or maybe freeze him in the permafrost. Or if you can drop him into a tar pit, that will probably work too. But a lot of these places are quite difficult to get to and you are a bit dangerous, so don't go on your own. And then we need to hopefully make sure that the sediment has lots of minerals that are available. Now that's, that's probably the most difficult part because it's really hard to control that bit. And to be honest, a lot of the time, it's probably luck um, whether or not Mr. Snuffles would actually turn into a fossil. And then the biggest factor is that you have to wait for a long time, like maybe millions of years, which is gonna be a little bit difficult. So unfortunately, once you've buried Mr. Snuffles, you kind of just have to hope for the best and Hopefully, Mr. Snuffles would become a fossil, and then he would excite paleontologists of the future who dug him up and were very confused about why there was a hamster at the bottom of the seabed. Uh, and that's pretty much the end of my talk. I've gone through it very, very quickly, but I hope that if you have any questions uh, about how fossils form, I can do my best to answer them for you. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was... Uh... <laughs> Brilliant, as always, you've got an excellent way of uh, presenting and it's uh, really entertaining, so thank you for that. Um, as uh, Thomas said, if you do have any questions for him, um, please use the chat box if you're on the Zoom call and if you're on uh, the Facebook uh, stream, if you can just use the, um, the comment section there, please. Um, so how long do you, so you, it's millions of years this takes uh, to, to uh, or um, is it, does it matter what the animal is? Do animals, um, uh, are, are they fossilized quicker in this, if, if they're a certain species or is it, is, is it pretty much everything? That is a very, very good question. Um, so there's two parts to that question. The first part is that um, yes and no, it takes, so it does take a long, long time. Um, in the case of like perimineralization, it probably takes um, thousands, if not millions of years for that kind of process to occur. Um, but for the soft tissue preservation, we know that that happens surprisingly quickly, um, but it's very difficult to actually put a time frame on it because when, if you were to leave a fish um, just on your uh, kitchen counter and let it decay, that happens very, very quickly. It would probably be completely gone. Well, it would be a skeleton within weeks but it would be completely gone within a few years. Um, but actually when you start adding other variables in like lowering, lowering the temperature, you can really stretch out how long it takes for decay to happen. So um, we don't really put, when we're looking at it um, as taphonomists, we don't put like a time frame on it. We don't say, oh, it takes 25 years or 30 years. What we would just say is it would happen rapidly in comparison to turning into stone. Um, so it's very difficult to know exactly how long it would take, but we do know that when soft tissues are preserved, those tissues normally rot very, very quickly. So mm. fossilization must happen um, super, super quickly. So just a follow-up uh, question, follow question from that. Um, mm. if, the, if it's the outside of the, the creature that's, that's um, converted, should we say first, how, how does the inside of the animal then get 
to the, the state of fossilization? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. So actually, that's um, there's a lot of debate about how that actually happens. So uh, I talked about how the water can move through the rock, um, and we think that the water would probably um, move through the animal as well. And um, sometimes in some fossils, you do see the outside of the animal is preserved better than the inside of the animal. And that's actually surprisingly common. And that's probably because the minerals were coming from outside and basically moving very slowly through the fossil. Sometimes you have um, very, like I showed that fossil fish when it, in, it had all the insides preserved. That's probably because the bacteria who are eating um, all of the insides, they generated the right chemical conditions inside there. And because the, um, your body is made up of lots of different things, so your bones are made up of different minerals and different types of uh, chemicals than, say, uh, your intestines, um, when the bacteria start eating away at different parts of you, they liberate different minerals from the different bits. And so that allows those parts to become preserved early. Um, so yeah, that's a super great question. And then the second part of your question was about like, is there a bias between different animals? And the answer is like, absolutely. So the, the first big bias is it depends where you lived. So animals that lived in areas where you have lots of burial are much more likely to become fossils than animals like birds who live in trees. Trees, you don't get very much burial there. So generally birds are found in the fossil record in places where they've died and they've maybe crashed into a lake and then they've sunk to the bottom of the lake and then been buried very quickly. And also birds are very, very fragile. They have very fragile bones. Um, and so they're much less likely to turn into fossils than something with like an elephant that has very big, robust bones that are much less likely to be eaten by scavengers. So yeah, there's a massive bias. So I, I, for instance, in this fit, in my examples, I talked about my fossil fish, my pet fish. Fish are much more likely to become fossils than hamsters because they live in the sea. So they'd sink to the bottom of the sea and then get buried. Whereas hamsters live in the desert and they scurry around all over the place. And when they die, it's they might last a long time because there's not a super lot of scavengers there, but because sand doesn't bury things very well, there's the chance of hamsters becoming fossils is actually very low unless we dropped it in the bottom of the ocean. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from uh, the audience. Um, one from Noah, what, what is the smallest animal that has been fossilized? Oh my goodness, right, well. Um, well, microscopic animals um, get fossilized all the time. And um, we, uh, one example of a very, very small animal that gets um, uh, fossilized commonly is something called a coccolith, which you may never have heard of, but are these tiny little shelled animals. Um, and they are what chalk is made of. So chalk itself is actually millions upon billions upon billions of these fossils which are stuck together. Um, and so they're very, very tiny. And that's a really difficult question to answer actually, because a fossil technically is any part of an animal that has preserved. So sometimes we have very, very small fossils because we have tiny, tiny parts of animals that have preserved where the rest of the animal has rotted away. Um, but yeah, we get microscopic fossils. We get fossils of things like worms um, and basically pretty much um, all animals that have hard parts can turn, have the like chance to turn into the fossils if they're in the right environment. So you can get some absolutely tiny fossils that you need microscopes to see. Um, yeah, so that's a very difficult question to answer actually. It's a bit like saying what's the largest animal to ever fossilize and I guess we don't even know because we might have missed them. We might never have actually even discovered the smallest ones and we might not have dug up the biggest ones yet. So yeah, that's a super difficult question. Okay, um... A question from Alison. Um, would you mind talking a bit about why Lyme Regis has so many fossils and the conditions in, under which they fossilized? Yes. So Lyme Regis is a uh, an interesting place. Um, so I use the word Lagerstadt or Lagerstaten to describe somewhere which um, has lots and lots of fossils in it. So Lyme Regis or the rocks of the Lyme Regis of Lyme Regis um, is a Lagerstaten because there are so many fossils there. Now. We need to talk a little bit about a few things. So the rocks around Lyme Regis are actually referred to as the Blue Lias. And the Blue Lias was deposited in a tropical sea. It was fairly shallow. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was around about 100 metres, probably not much deeper than 100 metres. But I'm not an expert on the Blue Lias, so don't quote me on that one. Take it with a pinch of salt. 
But what's interesting about the blue lighters when you go there is that it's actually very beautiful, I think. You get these like lovely patterns. So you get this hard rock called limestone, which is a light gray. And then you get this sort of dark rock in between the layers. So it's like little sandwiches. And that dark rock is called shale. Um, and what's happening there is that um, we have like different cycles um, in, the, uh, in the ocean that allow different rocks to be deposited. So we'd have a, a period where the limestone would be deposited as a, like a soupy mud, which would eventually turn very, very hard. And then you have like lots of organic material being deposited on top of that, which is what the shales are, are become with like other sediments as well. And when animals, um, that black material, the shale stuff, is very, very, um, when it was deposited, had very low amounts of oxygen in it um, and lots of organic material. And basically, um, when the animals died, they would be buried very quickly in that, and that would stop them from decaying completely. And then more sediment would be buried on top of them and so on and so forth. And you get this, like, you get the beautiful lias effect. And because of that rapid burial in the deep ocean, scavengers couldn't get in and eat them and eat all of the... Um, uh, couldn't get in and eat all of the different organic materials. And so eventually over time, they, be, over time, they became, they turned to rock. And then another thing that's super interesting about that is that um, because they've been squished and so much rock has been buried above them, the black layers, which were very organic rich, they get squished. Um, and as they get buried deeper, they actually heat up a little bit. So the, all the fossils in there get slightly cooked. And, um, you, when you go there, when you, if you take the black material and you mush it up in your hands, you can smell it. It smells very oily. And that's because all of the organic material has turned to effectively like, pet, like close to petrol. So it's like petroleum. It's like what well, we call it like bitumen, I suppose. It's like bituminous. And um, so that's, how, that's why the animals were there, because they were buried very quickly and they were buried in an environment that had very little oxygen and that allowed them to basically turn into fossils over millions of years. And that's why Lyme Regis is so special because it has so many different types of organisms as well. So we have like fish and crustaceans and shellfish, but we also had like dinosaurs that got washed in, pterosaurs that sort of drowned probably or, or fell into the sea and then sank to the bottom. Um, and that's why Lyme Regis has that sort of amazing preservation that we see. And Lyme Regis also, while I'm yammering on about Lyme Regis, it also has a lot of very interesting preservation as well because um, you do get some soft tissues being preserved there. And those soft tissues generally are like in these sort of uh, lumps of rock called concretions. And they're super interesting. So that's when an animal has died and the bacteria have started eating away at the, the skin and the muscles. And then when they're eating, they're, because they're taking in lots of nutrients, they're also pooping at the same time. And that but when they um, excrete, they change the chemistry of the area around them. And that actually allows minerals to form in that area where the, the chemistry is slightly different. So you get like a, a different type of rock forming around the fossil. And that actually like locks it in and keeps the soft tissues. So that's why sometimes you see like fossil squids and fossil like um, cephalopods being preserved in, in Lyme Regis. Uh, and sometimes you get like beautifully preserved, fully articulated fish with all the skin and the scales because of those, that, that weird interaction between the bacteria and the minerals. So I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, very <laughs> nice. Um, a question here from Ujvo. Um, how DNA is extracted from a perfectly preserved fossil? Is it not affected by the action of the bacteria? Yeah, so, um, so there's two bits to unpack from this. Um, the first thing is that DNA doesn't tend, DNA doesn't fossilize very well. So DNA is a very complex, long um, chemical, effectively. So for, for, for anyone who doesn't know, um, all of our cells in our body have an instructions kit inside them, which, which allows them to create more cells. And that instructions kit is DNA. And DNA is uh, pairs of, of proteins that bond together in this uh, beautiful spiral called a double helix. Now, the double helix is very, very long. Like if you were to unravel a strand of DNA, even though it's very, very thin, it would stretch for meters and meters and meters of very, very long. And it's incredibly fragile. So it breaks down over time. So if you were to leave DNA, if you could, in a pot of water, say, and you were to leave it, um, it would degrade very quickly. 
So actually turning into a fossil is, is really, really difficult, like super difficult, because it, it, just leaving it over time, it, it breaks down, let alone all of the processes which actually um, are needed to turn uh, squishy stuff into rock. So there's a couple of problems here. F DNA has not been extracted from rock material, um, or it might have been, but we're not 100% sure. There's a lot of controversy. It's very difficult. So and things like amber from Jurassic Park, which you might have heard of where they extract dinosaur DNA from it. Again, the DNA inside there is, is completely degraded and rotten away. So it's almost impossible to extract DNA from, from that kind of stuff. In some of the more recent subfossils, like in the woolly mammoths or in the permafrost um, and in um, bones that haven't yet turned to rock. So things like from maybe a saber cat or a giant ground sloth, uh, several, maybe a hundred thousand years old, uh, maybe a little bit older than that. We can extract fragments of DNA, but we can't extract the whole string of DNA. Um, yeah, so basically the, the long answer is that DNA doesn't preserve, um, the short answer is that DNA doesn't tend to preserve in, in rocks. It's very, very rare. And the other big problem is, is that actually extract, even if we could extract the DNA, even if it was there, our techniques for extracting the DNA are, at the moment are still quite primitive. And it's very difficult in the lab to make sure that you're extracting the DNA from the actual fossil and not from maybe bacteria that were in the rocks or in like, accidentally contaminating it. So it's really, really tough. Um, and there are lots of scientists who are working on this at the moment who would give much better answers than I could. Thank you for that. Um, another question from Noah. Um, have you found any fossils of animals that had diseases? Mm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So there is a whole um subscience within taphonomy uh, within paleontology called paleopathology pathology is the study of illnesses and paleo is obviously ancient so it's the study of ancient illnesses and i'm just going to share my screen again very quickly um and i'm just going to go right back oh my goodness i'm going to go all the way back to my first one of my first slides so just bear with me two seconds uh, so whistle stop tour through my my talk where are we? So here we go. So this is um, the Allosaurus at uh, the Lapworth Museum. And if you look very closely at the middle toe here at the bottom, you can see it has a big lump on it. Um, and actually, you can't see it in this photo, um, but he also has a, a funny lump on one of his ribs as well. And that's because um, we think that this Allosaurus hurt itself either when it was hunting or it was attacked by another animal or maybe another Allosaurus and the wound didn't heal properly, probably was infected and might have been the reason why this Allosaurus actually died in the end was because it had an infected foot. Um, and we see that a lot in different animals. Um, we see it a lot in dinosaurs. Um, and we also see, not only do we see, um, not only do we see uh, diseases, but we can also see like wounds. So for instance, there have been um, stegosaurs that have um, bite marks um, in their plates. Um, we found some dinosaurs and also other like marine reptiles that have teeth embedded in their like vertebrae and they've survived. And we've also, um, there's one, I went to a museum in America um, called the Peabody Museum and they have a giant uh, marine turtle that's missing a flipper and its whole flipper has been bitten off and it looks like it had it, it survived and carried on living without a flipper. So we see lots of um, injuries in the fossil record. We also see uh, the record of diseases as well. So for instance, in some dinosaurs, we find evidence for arthritis in their knees. We find um, in um, the bones, uh, we find sometimes evidence for parasites. And one thing that's really cool, in some dinosaurs, we found evidence for parasites, which we see in modern birds, which is another um, piece of evidence that birds are actually dinosaurs and, you know, su survived the mass extinction. Um, and we also have uh, fossils of parasites. So I've been working on 300 million year old fossils of fossil fish. And sometimes you have these like weird white lines coming out of the fish and we're not sure what they are, but they could be fossil parasite worms that were trying to escape when the animal had died and was starting to become fossilized. So yeah, there, we, that is a great question. And we do find lots of evidence for illness and disease in the fossil record.
And like I said, it's a whole science that you can study if you wanted to called paleopathology.